Good? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks so much for coming. I'm Alex Pollock, now of the R Street Institute, and with my colleague Kevin Kozar, whose idea this event was, we welcome you to a conference on the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report five years later, which it is five years already. What have we learned since, and what have we already forgotten? Debates about the financial crisis of 2007-2009 keep reminding us that economics is not a science. So it can't be used by governments to manage economies to some preordained outcome. As we all know, economics is not very good at all at predicting the future, and it's not even very good at agreeing on what happened in the past, uh, as this uh, crisis and its subsequent discussions show. But accepted stories, uh, or what we might call myths, do get established. Uh, taking one from history, for example, concerning another crisis, we have the story that Herbert Hoover was a do-nothing president in the developing depression, whereas in fact he was an energetic interventionist. And the real question is, were his many interventions good or bad? When it comes to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission report, remember that this report was actually three reports. The majority report voted on by, uh, voted for by the six Democratic commissioners and no Republicans basically concluded that the biggest problem was not enough government intervention. A dissent of three of the Republican commissioners discussed how the causes of the crises were many and interacting, as we were saying before, dug a reasonable discussion. A second dissent by my colleague Peter Wallison argued in detail that the biggest problem was too much government intervention, in particular in housing finance, and thus extreme distortion of housing finance and housing markets. Now, in the five years since these three reports, what have we learned? And what have we already forgotten? And our outstanding panel is going to tell us. Let me introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. First will be Doug holtz Eakin, the president of the American Action Forum, where we are. Doug was a commissioner of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. He's also been chief economist of the Council of Economic Advisors, director of the Congressional Budget Office, senior fellow of the Peterson Institute, director of the Greenberg Center for Geoeconomic Studies, and held the chair in international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, next will be Tom Stanton, a fellow at Johns Hopkins University and past president of the Association for Federal Enterprise Risk Management. And <clears throat> uh, Tom was a senior staffer on the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and subsequently wrote, Why Some Firms Thrive and Others Fail, Governance and Management Lessons from the Crisis. Tom is also the author of A State of Risk, the first book to skewer the fundamentally perverse structure of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and is co-author of Managing Risk and Performance. Our third speaker will be Philip Wallach, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the author of To the Edge, Legality, Legitimacy, and Responses to the 2008 Financial Crisis. In examining the legitimacy challenge faced by America's administrative state, Philip is right on point today since the report of the majority of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission rationalized a huge increase in this administrative state. In your conference materials uh, is his paper, along with those by other speakers, uh, on the challenges of legitimating the responses to the crisis. Uh, next will be Peter Wallison, co-director of the American Enterprise Institute's Program on Financial Policy Studies. Peter previously served as General Counsel of the U.S. Treasury and as White House Counsel to President Reagan. <clears throat> and he is the author of Ronald Reagan, The Power of Conviction and the Success of His Presidency, a book I highly recommend to everybody. And of also of privatizing Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, <clears throat> and the federal home loan banks, among many other works. Uh, following his dissent at the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, Peter's analysis and conclusions have been published as hidden in plain sight. 
Our final speaker will be Ted Murphy, who is a specialist in financial market issues for the Congressional Research Service, where he has authored reports on issues of the financial crisis, including housing and securitization problems during the boom, diagnostic issues during the panic, and policy options during the subsequent financial reform debates. Uh, today, Ted is also going to help us put the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission into historical perspective. As he will point out, there have been other such commissions uh, following other financial crises in history. Uh, each panelist is going to talk from 12 to 15 minutes, after which we'll give them a chance to react to each other's ideas or clarify points. Uh, then we'll open the floor to your questions and we'll adjourn promptly at noon. Doug, thanks very much for having us here, and uh, you have the floor. Uh, well, thank you, Alex and, and R Street, for um, having this event, um, I think, um, and welcome to the American Action Forum. Uh, there have been times when I've, I've tried very hard to uh, try to forget the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, and um, I, I, we now have made it impossible to do that, so I'm going to work through my PTSD and, and talk a little bit about the, what we've learned in the past five years. Um, one of the things I learned um, was how not to run a commission, um, quite frankly. I think Peter will remember as well the, the, the days when the ten of us literally sat in a room uh, for a full day while uh, the, the chair, Mr. Angelides, encouraged us to come to consensus and as a group of ten write a report detailing the causes of the financial crisis in the United States. It, it's simply no way to run a commission, uh, and it, it's very painful. Um, is that fair? <laughs> oh, it's painful for me. <laughs> um, so, so you know, for those of you who um, uh, sort of may end up in this position in the future, what you want to do is to hire as uh, the chief of staff of your commission someone who should be on the commission. Tell them to go write a report, uh, and then take that report to each commissioner and see what they di agree and disagree with until you, if, you're, if there is going to be consensus, you can arrive at that consensus. There's a, there's a lesson there for me. I, this was the first time I've been in this situation, and I, I certainly found it to be a, a very frustrating process. Uh, a, a corollary to that lesson is, if Mitch McConnell asks you to be on a commission, say no. Um, such is life. Uh, the second thing I learned, uh, and we knew it at the time, but it's become increasingly clear in the five years afterwards, is uh, the commission was a, a political uh, entity. It, it, its ostensible task was to write a report to the American people detailing the, the, the causes of the financial crisis that they could understand and as a nation they could embrace and, and as a result um, uh, turn and, and do sensible things to ameliorate the chances of something like this happening again. It, that, that wasn't really its purpose. It, it's per the the Dodd-Frank legislation, what became Dodd-Frank legislation, was already moving. The administration had made its proposals before we, we even began to work. Um, so the notion that somehow this was informing uh, some sort of legislative and or regulatory response was, was never uh, the agenda. The agenda was to deal with the politics uh, of the financial crisis. And on, on that one, um, however reasonable the dissent I participated in may have been, I, I think the, the people who believe in um, uh, limited government, uh, economic freedom, markets, uh, lost badly in, in this episode. Uh, the prevailing narrative for the cause of the financial crisis remains to this day that greedy bankers uh, rigged the game in Washington and um, in, in imposed this crisis on the American people for their own benefit. Um, that, that's completely wrong, um, but it still has a phenomenal amount of resonance with the American people. If we, we've done some recent polling on this. That, that, that narrative um, uh, continues to be quite popular. So in, in terms of the politics, uh, I, I think I learned a lot about how important it is to have a nice clean message uh, coming out of this. Uh, a, a reasonable set of 10 causes of financial crisis is not a clean message. It's, it's not something that's easily communicated to American people. And on, on the politics of setting the agenda for a sensible response, I, I don't think we, we uh, were very successful. And then there's the substance of the response. And um, I, I think, you know, I wrote a paper called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly um, with a uh, uh, Megan Malloy, who's hiding in the back, and um, you know, if you look at what we've done since, you know, th there are some things that make sense to me. Um, you know, it's good to see better capitalized large financial institutions. They're, you know, capital is one of the the great um, uh, uh, asset, 
poor choice of words. Capital forgives a lot of sins. You know, if you're holding capital um, uh, and your own money is at risk, you'll do better due diligence, and um, when mistakes are made, you'll be able to absorb those losses. So that, that's been a step in the right direction. I also think there was a, a modest step in the right direction on, on the credit rating agencies. Um, I, I'll say one of the big surprises to me, uh, one of the things I really changed my mind about during the, the course of the commission was, was the rating agencies. I went into it with the, the strong bias that people participating in, the, in these transactions were, were large, sophisticated places like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan's, and, and they were going to be easily able to do their own due diligence on uh, the, the securities and the underlying mortgages and, and their likely um, uh, financial performance, um, and the rating agencies would be irrelevant. It wouldn't matter what label they put on it. They, they'd know the truth underneath those things. That turned out not to be the case. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, it was one of the two shocking moments in, in the commission that I realized they, they didn't do the due diligence, they just took the ratings and, and went. And uh, the rating agencies turned out to be more important than I thought. And so closer scrutiny of the agencies themselves, I think, is a beneficial thing going forward. Um, the other big surprise, by the way, was uh, uh, the level of incompetence at AIG, where they literally testified under oath that they were unaware, the chief risk officer and the chief uh, financial officer, was unaware that their contracts with Goldman Sachs required them to put up cash if the underlying securities declined in value. They didn't know that. They were surprised when Goldman asked for their $10 billion. And it was one of the worst days of my life because I'm one of the guys who defends the right of a company to pay people as much as they want. And it was a tough thing to defend the 100 million bucks they walked away with. So that was ridiculous. Um, so two big surprises in there. But those are the good news things. Um, there's some, been some bad things, to, to say the least. Um, there, the, the narrative that somehow fancy derivative transactions caused the crisis is all wrong. There was only one derivative involved in the crisis, and that fact was the AIG credit default swaps. But we undertook a vast uh, uh, re-regulation of, of derivatives markets uh, in the aftermath on the basis of no contribution whatsoever. Uh, same would be true for the Volcker rule. There's no evidence that proprietary trading contributed to the crisis. It was not a trading crisis. It was, it was a fundamentally um, uh, lending crisis and bad underwriting, and um, you know the vocal rule is one of the most complex, expensive, difficult things to comply with, uh, and it serves no real purpose in responding to the crisis. Um, I'd also say the same is true for a lot of the disclosures. I mean, the, the poster child for for uh, uh, overreach on disclosures is the conflict minerals rule, um, which has uh, decimated the Congo and done very little else. Um, and, and you know, it, it's hard to defend those kinds of things. And then there are things that I think are just genuinely ugly. Um, and, and one would be the orderly liquidation authority, which uh, memorializes in, in statute uh, the, the, the capacity for the government to continue to, to prop up uh, large financial institutions, and, and as a result, takes the basic instinct of all policymakers and now gives them uh, sort of a, a little more rope to go um, uh, help people out in a way that I just think is unhelpful. It's important to remember that the notion of too big to fail is not something the private sector does. It's the policymakers. They're the ones who are so risk averse that they step in no matter what and they don't let people fail. This makes it easier for them to do that. I think it's a big step in the wrong direction. And then um, I, I'd say the, the other proactively bad thing is the, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is the FSOC is, it, it's just, it was a bad idea to begin with and, and it's actual operation, which is almost like the Stalinist justice system. Um, you, know, you can't get out once you're in. Um, there's no plausible um, uh, case made for why people are designated as CIFIs. Um, I, I will go to my grave confused by the, the MetLife and Prudential designations on the substance. They make no sense. Um, this, this is something I think we're going to wrestle with for a long time. And then I'll close um, with, with the last one, which is, you know, I. Um, I'm now 58 years old, and I guess I remain uh, naive because I never would have bet that I'd be sitting at a table in 2016 and we would not have seen substantial reforms to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or, or, or have them be gone. Um, they, they, they made no sense in 2003 when I was at CBO. Uh, they were uh, walking uh, a, a dynamite from the financial system in the crisis, and I, I thought, surely, um, common sense will prevail and, and, and we will get rid of these things. Uh, but here we are and, and they have survived this as well. And so that, that's a, a shock to me and, and uh, a lesson in just how hard it is to, to get some of these reforms done in, in Washington, D.C.
Thank you, Doug. Well, they, uh, Fanny and Freddie were a bad idea when Tom Stanton wrote his first book on them in 1991. <laughs> Tom. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to add one piece of advice to Doug's in terms of if you're invited to join a commission, and that is join the staff. As the, as the staff, we spent day in and day out interviewing people, trying to understand what was going on, reading documents. It was a mind-bending experience, and every once in a while the commissioners would come in and do high policy. And that was great. I, I didn't realize what the, what the experience was like, because we were busy interviewing CEOs, traders, bankers, risk officers, policy makers, regulators, and trying to get a picture. And my big regret is that at the end of the year, because we had a very tight budget and a very tight timeline, at the end of the year, I finally knew enough to ask good questions in the interviews. Um, but it was a mind-bending experience uh, and, and just fantastic. Also, the commission did its work at just the right time, 2010, when people were still shocked by the carnage now there's an awful lot of varnish that's been placed over analyses. Um, right after the commission finished its work, Ben Heinemann, former uh, general counsel of General Electric, came out with an angry uh, article in Atlantic saying that the commission had failed in terms of studying governance and risk management. And I thought that was a great impetus and I, I produced this book, Why Some Firms Thrive While Others Fail. And I looked at a dozen firms, four of which navigated the crisis well, and eight of which uh, cratered in one way or another. And this came about in part sitting in an interview with some Fannie Mae vice president who was whining about how nobody could see a nationwide drop in housing prices. And so what I wanted to do was look at the firms that succeeded, that navigated the crisis, and the firms uh, that cratered. And in the end, uh, there was a very simple message. Um, first of all, there are warning signs. I would consider my book a warning sign, except Fanny tended to dislike the messenger more than the message. Um, Investigating is a lot less costly than ignoring the warnings. You need constructive dialogue, which is a process where you have a respectful exchange of views between the people that want to plunge forward and the people that are worried about the downside risk. And for me, it was remarkable to see how information, particularly in today's complex world, complex organizations, technologies, products, etc., information is bottled up at lower levels of the organization. And Classic was Citigroup, where you had two uh, subsidiaries busy acquiring subprime mortgages because the pricing was really good, and one subsidiary desperately trying to unload because they saw that something was really wrong. And somehow nobody was talking across that organization. Uh, Chuck Prince, the CEO, once joked, City didn't just have one good culture, it had five or six good cultures. And that's really the sign of an organization that has grown way too much and is way too unwieldy. So information flow is essential, up and down the hierarchy and across the business units. To my mind, the crisis was Tolstoy in reverse. You remember Anna Karenina, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are different in their own way. Well, in the financial crisis, the firms that successfully navigated were all different. They all had their own business strategies. They had different organizational forms, uh, they were doing different things, and they did it in different ways, but their information flow was superb. So that allowed them to do that. And the unhappy families, the firms that cratered, were all alike. They simply didn't get it, and it was stunning. Let me give a couple of examples, positive examples. J.P. Morgan Chase, already as early as October of 06, um, reported higher delinquencies in their mortgage unit than they were expecting. 
The report went up to the operating committee. The operating committee had a food fight. You know, what's going on here? It turned out their delinquency rates were lower than other people's delinquency rates. So instructions went down to the investment bank, shed your exposure. Goldman Sachs was quite similar. Goldman Sachs, and this was December of 06, lost money when their models said they should have made money. And after they particularly got hammered, Nan Sparks, the head of the mortgage desk, sent a message up to the top of Goldman Sachs saying, we got a problem, um, I don't know what's going on. And as he reported it, uh, all these people came down from the top floors, looked over his shoulder and asked him, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And uh, it, it turns out mortgages were a real backwater of these firms. They were just sort of a cash cow, but they weren't really sort of a leading edge of attention. So all these people were trying to figure out what went on. They figured it out to the best of their ability and instructions went down and it was a different strategy because Goldman is in what they call the moving business, not the storage business. They went closer to home. They shorted on their mortgage portfolio. We interviewed one guy who had lo whose portfolio had lost $550 million. And I asked my minder, you know, what's going on here? And the answer was, don't worry, we shorted it on the other end. Um, so we had a fantastic time uh, as staff, understanding what was going on. And one of the big lessons is governance, that these institutions, complex as they are, have got to improve their governance and management. And somehow, somebody's got to deal with that. And that's a segue into the second topic I'd like to raise, which is bank supervision. We didn't have time to really dig into bank supervision, but bank supervision was really difficult. I can say quite clearly, bank supervision didn't add any value in the crisis. You found top examiners that were really good, had the interpersonal skills, they could talk to the CEOs, whatever. But the average examiner can't go to a CEO and say, gee, you're making too much money here because you're making too many, taking too many risks. You ought to trim your profits, trim your sales here, and uh, who knows, uh, maybe a risk will materialize someday that you will have averted. Um, that's a really hard sell and particularly for a GS-15 examiner. Uh, the supervisors lack resources. Uh, one of the areas where it came to light in the London Whale, you had 65 uh, examiners from the OCC. You had 35 plus examiners from the Fed at the holding company level um, to look at an institution of $2.4 trillion. So the examiners are overwhelmed. They also have a troubled culture. In 2009, Federal Reserve Bank of New York um, try, did a study which is really impressive to look for real feedback under Professor David Beim of Columbia to try to figure out what was going on and the answers they got back were that examiners were afraid to stick their head up. They were afraid to say anything until they found out what their boss wanted them to say. It's a very troubled, very ingrown culture. And of course, Examiners very often are much less knowledgeable than the people they're looking at. I mean, you, I don't know if you heard about uh, This American Life had a feature about a woman who alleged that uh, she was uh, basically told she couldn't report certain things um, and she thought it was pressure from Goldman Sachs, which she was examining. My read on the transcript, and I could be wrong, but at least to suggest to you was this woman had come out of an anti-money laundering background and she was looking at a repo transaction which totally offended her because, right, I mean, I don't want to go into it, I don't have time, but uh, basically she was importing her knowledge from a totally different area to try to understand something that had to be understood differently. Um, so these people have lack of status, lack of resources, and you end up with a check in the box mentality that means that they're looking at the little things rather than looking at the big things. And if I had to give a generalization, too many people, both in government, the supervisory staff, and in the private sector, were looking at the wrong things when they got hit um, by this crisis. So can we create a win-win? 
I believe in this idea of constructive dialogue, and I think the, my best expression, unlike Don Frank, right, it imposes a lot of burdens um, and a lot of detailed requirements, but there are a lot of core issues it doesn't address. What would a win-win look like? And my favorite expression comes from Edmund Clark, one of the four banks I looked at, Toronto Dominion Bank, TD Bank. There must be productive working partnerships between the industry and its regulators, enabling both parties to agree in principle on what needs to be done and on the least intrusive way of making it happen. Canada is different from the United States. Alex and I have had a number of conversations about that. But that's still um, my view that if you look at information flow as being essential, the essential ingredient, then I think it's valuable for the banks, the regulated institutions, to work to upgrade the quality of their supervision so that these examiners are not going after the penny ante stuff. They won't have the technical competence to give answers, but they can ask good questions. For example, in the London Whale case, the classic question to ask was, are you making all of this money out of your London office? be in a highly competitive market because you're smarter than everybody else or are you making this money because you're taking more risks than everybody else and just asking that question in the right place and remember there was a missing link in the flow of information from uh, the london office to headquarters at jp morgan just raising that question uh, could have provided a real service so I think there's a win-win out there, um, and I would hope we can build on our experiences to get there. Thanks very much, Tom. You know, from what Doug and Tom said, it sounds like the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission itself had this bottling of information up <laughs> uh, away from the top, just, just as you described, uh -huh. mm -hmm. in the troubled banks. Uh, Phil. All right, well, thanks. It's, it's a real honor to be on this panel. Um, I'm actually going to start my remarks by telling you about a dream I had this morning. Uh, and I'm not, not making this up. Um, we were having this event, and it wasn't in this lovely room provided by uh, Doug's outfit. We were in a sort of garden terrace, like you might imagine a Downton Abbey or something. Um, Alex Pollock was speaking before me rather than moderating, and he gave a riveting personal account of how uh, his examination of the financial crisis had converted him from the court party to the country party. <laughs> um, so I spoke after him, which was a tall order, uh, and the audience was all walking around getting food and drinks. And the dream ended with, uh, you know, to put it all in perspective, the dream ended with Leonardo DiCaprio and a woman playing the, one of Schumann's forehand piano pieces. Uh, so why should I bother telling you about that? Uh, hopefully the thing about the piano is just amusing. Um, the thing about Alex and his conversion experience, I think, is, is I'll give you my interpretation, which happily relates to what I wanted to talk about anyway. Um, and that is that five years after the FCIC report and about seven years past the worst of the crisis, we really, I, I think, in my judgment, there is no clearly dominant master narrative of the crisis yet. Um, I, I think there are three, three big competing narratives that, that, are, that are still trying to elbow out the others, um, and I want to walk through those. But I think because, because we have not yet established sort of one dominant narrative, and of course there will never be just one narrative. We don't have one narrative of the Great Depression, you know, 80 years on from that. Uh, but there, there's sort of some dominant ways that it resonates in cultural understanding. And so as long as we don't have a dominant uh, master narrative of the crisis, all, all kinds of diagnosis is going to be extremely politically fraught. Uh, there's huge political stakes. I think the FCIC and any kind of commission coming into that kind of environment is bound to be an exercise in political positioning. Um, I think... Um, as I'll talk about a little bit later, I think what was remarkable is how there wasn't such a clear message to come out of that. Um, but what are the three narratives? Let me, let me tell you what I think they are. So I, I'm drawing on this idea that there are different, there are sort of some master narratives in, in, uh, in novels and fiction. 
one of the main ones is overcoming the monster. Um, so there's an establishment version of amorphous terror that descends utterly unpredictably upon us, um, and it's vanquished by agile defenders of the realm, even as sort of a stubborn public slows their efforts to fight the beast down. Um, so this narrative commands quite a bit of star power. Uh, it, it got its own HBO, stock, uh, you know, not, not documentary, but sort of true life take on the crisis based on air, uh, Andrew Sorkin's Too Big to Fail. And you know, so it got William Hurt as Hank Paulson, Paul Giamatti as Ben Bernanke, Billy Crudup as Timothy Geithner, and they, they fought it off, they saved the world. Um, people who believe that narrative tend to think that the monster repellents that we've put in place since the crisis are basically adequate. Um, and they think that it's a self-destructive impulse to blame the firemen for the fire uh, as they see it happening, um, especially with uh, the sort of backlash against the Federal Reserve. Um, then there's the anti-Wall Street version, which is um, that greedy vampire squids were insufficiently policed, and they, so they blew up the world. Um, a few accept that part of the narrative, but then try to say, and the squids were vanquished by Dodd-Frank and some other reforms. That's sort of the Barney Frank line. Um, more often the message is that the squids are still at large, or even strengthened by the government's various inter interventions. They're not in jail where they belong. They're menacing society and pulling the strings of our mainstream politicians. And we need some kind of pure of heart St. George to come slay them. Um, so depending on your aesthetic or political predilections, that might be Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or Ted Cruz or even somehow Donald Trump. Uh, that's, that's got a very widespread appeal. I would probably agree that, that that is sort of the narrative with the largest constituent base today. Uh, it, it has certainly some different, different political flavors that it comes in. Um, it has much greater intuitive appeal for adherents of the country party, as it were, uh, the ant, ant, people who see themselves as anti-establishment, uh, who, see, who see Washington, D.C. As, as a fundamentally corrupt place. And it now has probably the greatest star power, thanks to the big short. Uh, it's got Christian Bale, Ryan Gosling, and even Brad Pitt running around as the rare financiers who understood the idiocy and depravity of the rest of their kind of bankers. And the, the message from this narrative is that we still have to do much more. We ought to still find a way to throw people in jail today, never mind the statutes of limitations. Uh, we ought to find ways to smash the big banks because, gosh, they sure deserve it. Um, the third, the third uh, narrative is Peters, uh, I would say, is, is, the, is the, leading, the leading advocate. Uh, and it's sort of a classic tragedy um, in, in, the, in the genre of what Albert Hirschman called the perversity argument, which is that well-intentioned people uh, have some goal, and in pursuing it, it totally backfires and, and causes um, disaster. So maybe, you know, you can, you can differ on how much you see the goal of spreading home ownership as well intentioned and how much it became uh, a sort of very, very much self-interested venture for the people who were in it to make money. But the idea is that it utterly degraded the process of making sound loans and brought us to disaster. Um, and as has already been mentioned, if that's your narrative, Wallison is Cassandra, and we still haven't listened those, uh, those beasts are still at large, um, remarkably. So those are the three competing narratives that I see. There's, there's you know, very active competition among them, certainly. Um, some people can draw from, from different strands from each of them. Um, there's probably some truth in all of them, to my mind. Um, but most people want to pick one, because each of them has sort of the promise of catharsis some, somewhere uh, if we take certain kinds of political actions. And so people don't want to believe 
it's really complicated. There's complicated organizational failures going on. Um, there's a very strong, strong, strong desire to put things in, in good and evil terms. My own, my own predilection is to apply Wallach's Law. Wallach's Law is that everything is more amateurish than you think even after applying Wallach's Law. Um, and so, uh, so to me that goes a long way toward explaining the crisis. Um, my own book, uh, To the Edge, which is on sale on Amazon, uh, it, it tells a story that is, does not fit into any of these narratives very well. It says that the government did a lot of really legally dubious things and nobody much cared um, about the ones that turned out to be effective. Uh, the things, some of the things the government did that made people angriest, like paying out bonuses at AIG after it had decided to uh, keep that company afloat. That was sort of the apogee of, of outrage in March of 2009. Um, that was pretty much, there was no choice but to do that uh, following the law. So I think people have a strong desire for a clean, clean cut narrative. Um, the FCIC's re main report, you know, which is a very rich document, and I drew on it a lot in, in my, my book. It has, you know, this archive of interviews is online. You can go listen to the same interviews. Um, that Tom and his colleagues were involved in. Um, it's, it's, it's a great resource, but what came out of it was this 400-page report with 18 different causes floating around that was dissented from by all of the members from minority political party. Um, and you had two minority reports. People sort of received it as a muddle. It, it wasn't the kind of thing that helped them set things in line. That's in contrast, I think, to what happened uh, beginning in 1932 and 1933, as we moved from Hoover to Roosevelt, with whatever justice, I think the master narrative got very well established there, that bankers had, um, you know, it was greedy bankers, the government hadn't done enough, and by God, we were going to smash those malefactors of wealth uh, at the beginning of FDR's term. I mean, the, the contrast between the Hoover FDR transition and the Bush Obama transition is really one of the most striking things about the crisis. FDR would not speak to anyone in the Hoover administration after being elected in November 1932. I, I always used to think that that was the sign of some terrible sort of arrogance, but it was really a political masterstroke to be able to say, that was them and this is us. We are totally different. We are bringing you something completely new and energetic. And they did a lot of things, as we know in retrospect, that were deeply harmful. But in terms of establishing the legitimacy of the new government, uh, that was much more effective. The Obama administration really did not denounce the Bush administration's responses. They largely chose a course of continuity. Now, you might think, and I largely think, that that was to their credit, um, that had they, had they tried to totally reset things, that, that they may have made them considerably worse. Um, but in any case, one can say that uh, by, by pursuing that strategy of continuity, they lost a real opportunity to center around a, 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 a sort of clean break, let's, let's smash up the banks uh, mentality that would have served them much better in terms of establishing their legitimacy to continue to fight the crisis. And so, you know, from my perspective, uh, and then Dodd-Frank is sort of a lot of the same story. Dodd-Frank has a whole lot of, it's many, many things all rolled together. You know, Dodd-Frank has an audit the Fed bill in there that Bernie Sanders uh, and Ron Paul were working to get in. Uh, that, that's, that was in there. They did an audit of the Fed thanks to some stuff in part 11 of Dodd-Frank. Um, that, they had a conflict minerals bill, which was basically a sanctions bill thrown in because Dodd-Frank was legislation that was moving. It had some credit agency reforms that never really made it into the public consciousness for some reason. People just have the impression that nothing happened about credit rating agencies. That's not true. The government did some things to decouple regulatory requirements from credit rating agencies. Um, a healthy reform. Um, it had the Volcker, the Volcker rule and the swaps push out, which were both 
just calculated attempts. The people running the bill did not believe those were good policies, but they needed to bring certain people into their coalition who did. So they, they just did it uh, without really believing that it was going to do any good. Um, and then they changed the Fed's powers and the FDIC's powers, really a rather significant reconfiguration of, of what might happen uh, should the government want to close down an investment bank or an insurance company that was systemically important. And we could talk all day about whether that was successful or not. Um, but it, that, that was certainly a big deal. Um, so my bottom line is it's kind of remarkable here we are in 2016, that really I don't think we're very far along in, in having one narrative win out. Um, and as a result, discussions like the one we're having today are always going to be very, very politically fraught. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a political scientist by training, so I, I guess the policy arguments and the politics uh, and the diagnosis of exactly what went wrong in the mid-2000s um, are all very hard to unroll, unwind from each other at the moment, and um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks, Philip. I, I just have one question. If Peter is Cassandra, who is Agamemnon? <laughs> We're waiting for Agamemnon, I guess, is, is your thesis. Sounds like a good play. <laughs> Peter. Well, thank you, Alex. Let me see if I got this right. Okay, I know how to switch the slides. I'll have some slides. Um, I am not going to recite for you the third narrative um, of Philip's third narrative because I've done it dozens and dozens of times and it's in that book. Um, and so my effort today will be to talk a little bit about why the, uh, more than a little bit I suppose, about why the FCIC was wrong. And uh, I'll be presenting sort of evidence from my perspective of why it was wrong and why my narrative then by by uh, some sort of implication was right, but that's not something I'm going to try to convince you about right now, just that the FCIC was wrong. Now, Doug and, and Tom gave some pretty interesting uh, insights about the FCIC. Doug talked about the dysfunction of the commission itself, the, the 10 commissioners, which I second completely. It was a completely dysfunctional operation. We really had no idea what was going on, and yet we were actually supposed to know what was going on. The, the, the crowning um, view, uh, the crowning fact is that nine days before the thing was supposed to be published, we got a 900-page uh, report that we had never sat down and looked at together. Uh, and we didn't have a chance to sit down and look out together. So the report was very much um, simply the views of the chairman and probably some of the senior people on the staff. Now, all of this is actually in uh, my book, which is hidden in plain sight. Um, but there's more. And one of the things that I wanted to say about what Tom said is that a lot of the staff's time was done on interviews. And I noticed that, and I put that in my discussion about the, the FCIC because interviews are a terrible way to try to decide what actually happened. Documents are the way to decide because documents put people down at a particular point in time about what they believed then and what was real then. Interviews, especially after something like the financial crisis, simply turn up the conventional ideas that exist at that time. And so we got in those interviews, I believe, and I didn't get a chance to read all of them. In fact, I never knew they were going on. Um, but when, when I did get a chance to read some of them, I saw just what I expected, and that is the very conventional views coming from everyone who was asked, from the people at Fannie Mae through people in the markets. Um, and that's why, in part, um, the report couldn't have been a good report unless it had gone into the documents. And today, maybe because I'm a lawyer, I'm going to go into some of the documents so you can see why the, why the uh, commission missed much of what was going on. Now, what caused the financial crisis was the, was the essence, I think, of what we were all dealing with. And, and um, here's the commission's 
uh, explanation of what caused it. Now, lots of explanations of many throughout the book, but this is the one that in, in a paragraph explains it, and that is, it was the collapse of the housing bubble, fueled by low interest rates, easy and available credit, scant regulation, and toxic mortgages. <coughs> That was the spark that ignited a string of events which led to a full-blown crisis in the fall of 2008. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, forgot to turn off my phone. Um, in any event, uh, now my explanation is the affordable housing goals. And if you look at that, if you look at that um, chart, you can see that the affordable housing goals were adopted in the early 1990s, actually in 1993, but in 1996 they started to rise. And there were three different goals. One was uh, the so-called low-moderate goal, which was for people who were at or below the median income, and then there was one for people who were at 60 or 80 percent of median income, and then one for uh, minorities. Um, and those goals all went up, so that by 2008 about 56 percent of all of the mortgages Fannie and Freddie were required to buy, 56% of those by 2008 had to be made to people at or below the median income or meeting one of the other um, base goals that are, that are on that. So, if we look then at the next slide, this is what things looked like in 2008. Um, there were 31 million subprime or other low quality mortgages in the financial system in 2008. 76% uh, of those were on the books of government agencies, primarily Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the remaining 24% were on the books of the private sector. That was not a small amount. It was about $2 trillion on the books of the private sector, accounting for why they had so much trouble. But why were all of these mortgages made um, and, and held finally by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and some other government agencies like FHA. Um, let's see, we have, uh, this is the FCIC's, this is the FCIC's uh, uh, description of what happened uh, with the affordable housing goals. And they say, we also studied at length how the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, contributed to the, use these affordable housing goals, and we determined that these goals only contributed marginally to Fannie and Freddie's participation in these mortgages. Here's what they said about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Sorry, with all these slides, it's kind of difficult to get them all together. Um, we find that the risky practices of Fannie Mae, particularly from 2000 on led to its fall. Practices, and here's the key language, undertaken to meet Wall Street's expectations for growth, to retain, uh, to regain market share, and to ensure generous compensation for its employees. In other words, they bought these very bad mortgages uh, for profits or for market share. Um, and that, I think, is the key problem with the FCIC report. That was a completely made up idea and is not consistent with the documentation that were, was provided to the FCIC by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but never used. This is a very interesting table published by Fannie Mae in 2009, um, and it shows what they call the key product features. Now, if you look at those, I, I, I'm going to give you a truncated version of just this, but the important point is that it was published in 2009. This table is Fannie Mae's description of what was wrong with their portfolio and the mortgages they held in 2009. The report of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission came out in 2011. This table was already available. All right, here's the truncated version. If you look at the items across the top, you can see all of the things that Ed Pinto, my colleague, who worked with me on many of these issues because he was doing a lot of research in the market, said were wrong with the mortgages that were being bought by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The FCIC denied that these were actually being made. Um, well, there's uncertainty about what a subprime, subprime mortgage is, and uh, Ed Pinto has exaggerated that. 
Fannie Mae in 2009 actually listed all of the reasons why these mortgages were subprime or otherwise risky. And then they show that of those, they had $837.8 billion in those mortgages on their books in 2008. And those mortgages resulted in 81.3% of their losses in 2008. So this was not trivial. This was not marginal. Okay, what happened after that? After Fannie and Freddie bought these mortgages, because they were the dominant players in the housing finance system, they caused most uh, underwriting standards to decline. If Fannie and Freddie were buying mortgages with no down payments, why would anyone make, or a 5% down payment, why would anyone bother making uh, another kind of mortgage? You'd have to compete with a bank that was willing to provide a mortgage with a 5% down payment or zero down payment. So all of the underwriting standards in the United States declined over time. Uh, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac knew from the, almost from the beginning that what they were buying was going to cause them difficulty. They just could not avoid buying them because of the rising quotas for the affordable housing goals. And I have in the documentation that does not appear anywhere in the report of the FCIC, but is in the materials that, was provide, that were provided to the FCIC, there's plenty of documentation of this. So let's start with this first one here, which says, where are we? We're on number 10. Okay, this is slide 10. Let's see if I can get it. Um, in, in 2002, uh, this is a quote from uh, a Fannie Mae document called the HUD Housing Goals, uh, which was published actually in 2003. In 2002, Fannie Mae exceeded all our goals for the ninth straight year. Now, I won't read the whole thing, but the exceptional point, the important points are, especially because the tenses around the meeting, about meeting the goals, meant that we considered not doing deals and not fulfilling our liquidity function, and we did deals at risks and prices we would not otherwise have done. Another one, this one is in 2005. Um, the cost of their mission, which is what the goals meant to Fannie and Freddie, their mission, uh, over the 2002 to 2005 period averaged $200 million a year. That doesn't sound like something that was profitable to these organizations. Uh, in 2005, another statement by Fannie and Freddie, deal economics were well below target returns. These were not public statements. These were statements made internally at Fannie um, and, and or disclosed to the FCIC but never used. Some deals producing negative returns. That was in 2005. In 2007, in an alignment meeting, now an alignment meeting at uh, Fannie Mae was one in which they were trying to make sure that they were getting their affordable housing goals in conformity with what the quota was at that time. They called that an alignment meeting. And they say in that, um, that the cost, this, at the very bottom you can see, a plan to meet the base goals was one of the things it, that was disclosed or put into the alignment meeting for the staff to consider. And the cost of meeting the goals in 2007 was going to be $1.15 billion. Again, no profitability there. Peter, I think you need to advance your slide. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, that's what I thought might happen. In any event, um, this one, this next one, um, are they advancing? Yeah, okay, this is just an example of, of, um, <laughs> how can this happen? <laughs> Never forget to turn off your phone. Um, these, are, these are mortgages that um, were bought by Fannie and Freddie uh, between 1999 and 2007. This is a HUD document. And I just wanted to point out that in 2007, these were mortgages with down payments of less than 5%. And you can see how over time they increased substantially. So that in 2007, um, 
uh, 50.9% 50 of those mortgages um, were in the special affordable category. Those were people who were 80 or 60% of the median income. So they had to continually reduce their underwriting standards in order to meet the quotas, and that's what this uh, shows. Um, Alex, how much time do I have? Uh, four minutes. Okay. Um, this is a 10K disclosure by Fannie Mae in 2006. We have also relaxed some of our underwriting criteria to obtain goals qualifying mortgage loans and increased our investments in higher risk mortgage loan products. For example, um, PL PLS, which are uh, <coughs> private uh, labeled securities that are uh, mortgage backed securities that are more likely to serve the borrowers targeted by HUD's goals and sub goals, which could increase our credit losses. Um, what were these uh, private label securities? These were, this is a report put out by FHFA, and you can see that the totals for Fannie and Freddie um, were, uh, in terms of those securities backed by subprime loans, about two, uh, I'm sorry, were uh, over $1 trillion, about $1 trillion, $12, million, $12 billion. And it's about a third of the total that was put out by uh, Wall Street during this period. So what we have is tremendous risks being taken by Fannie and Freddie on something that the FCIC regarded as only marginal. But they did it because of the affordable housing goals. Um, here's a Freddie financial report. Most of the stuff I have is from Fannie because it was Fannie that uh, the FCIC chose to <laughs> focus on and got most of their documents from Fannie. But here's a Freddie document. Deteriorating conditions in the mortgage credit markets, particularly res re with respect to greatly reduced origination of subprime mortgages and increases in the levels of goals, of uh, levels of sub goals. These factors make it substantially more difficult for us to meet all of the HUD goals and especially the home purchase goals for 2007 compared to previous years. So they were under tremendous pressure to make sure that they met these goals and they took risks in order to do so. Here's another Freddie report to the board of directors of Freddie and it says targeted affordable loans have a much higher expected default probabilities. Over one half of targeted affordable loans have higher expected default probabilities than the highest 5% of non-goal qualifying loans. So, there was no profit involved in what Fannie and Freddie were doing here. Um, the FCIC was wrong to say that they did it in order to gain support on Wall Street. Did they, gain, did they do it to gain support or increase their market share? And I'll just show you one, one table on that. This comes, this comes from the FHFA, and it shows various financial elements of Fannie. Um, but if we look at the average guarantee fee, the yellow line. Push your I, button, Peter. No, I haven't this, done it. Okay. Looks like you're, you've gotten to your last slide. Or this is my last slide. Um, if we look at the average guarantee fee, um, we can see that that increased over time between 2003 and 2007. Now, the guarantee fee is Fannie's charge for buying a loan, and if they were actually intending to uh, compete for market share, they wouldn't increase their guarantee fee, they would reduce their guarantee fee. So the whole idea that they did what they were doing in order to increase their market share is false. So what I've shown you here on the basis of documentation is that the FCIC was principally a political effort to provide support for further regulation um, by Congress and resulted eventually then in the Dodd-Frank Act. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much. Deb. Can I borrow the uh, clicker? See if my slides are next. They should just be following as you go along here. OK, well, actually, if you don't mind, I'll take someone else's slide. Um, <laughs> you all probably don't know me. There's, oh, I, you can touch two more, because those are slides I didn't use. I know, but I want to use that. Oh, OK. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> a, great, a great set of slides. Um, I yield my slides. <laughs> 
Uh, my name is Ted Murphy. I work for CRS, the Congressional Research Service, and we have some important business to do at the beginning of these. Uh, my views are my own. My expressions are my own. My agency is provides objective research to Congress and does not have any views, so it's not possible for me to express views of my employer. So that's an important disclaimer. And the other thing is, I, and there's six letters, not five. Five is wrong, and you get a big red mark. And if letters means different, different kinds of letters, the answer is five, and six is wrong. So very, it's going to be very important to come down to some definitions, which I promised to try to link to the FCIC report today and subsequent research. So I think it's worth looking here at the <coughs> real home prices, because what I like about this graph is it says real home prices. And that's why I wanted to pause for a second, because real applies adjusted for inflation. I want to say something about a mortgage contract. Now, I wasn't going to do it before I get to my slides. Um, mortgage contracts are collateralized contracts. And so much of the research that's gone into the crisis has looked at default rates. But it's really crucial if what you care about is losses. Correlation of default is not enough. To have losses, the house prices have to fall. And those house prices have to be nominal falls. This isn't necessarily about the fall in the real house price. For the mortgage borrower and the mortgage lender, those contracts are written in nominal terms. So anyway, great, great graph and it fed into the story, so we're all happy about that. At least I am. So thanks. All right, so um, FCIC in retrospect, you already got my disclaimer. Um, I was asked to look at two things today. Uh, one of them was to look at some of this. We have the report, and we have people that explain the parts of the report I thought very well. And, uh, to reflect a little bit on subsequent events, and does that confirm or cast doubt upon some of these various uh, views expressed in the report itself, and then to help place the report in the context. So um, I want to do a couple of preliminaries. First is the scope, because there isn't always necessarily agreement on what the financial crisis was. If we were to talk about the Great Depression, it's not necessarily, oh, the fluctuations in financial markets that happened in 1929. Or some people will say, oh, it was the banking crisis in 1931. Or other people will say, oh, it's the banking crisis in the winter of 32, 33. And other people will say, no, the, the Great Depression is the entire period. So if we have the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, what was the scope? What were they told to look at? And I think it's going to be relevant for our discussion in the panel, I bet, to <coughs> note that the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission was commissioned in May of 2009. So we they could not presumably be talking about how come we had such a slow recovery. It's really talking about financial markets in 2008, perhaps 2007, and the response in the winter of 2008-2009 is largely what they looked at. I want to talk a little bit about the definitions, thus the name thing, about words like liquidity. Words like liquidity get thrown around and they get used differently all of the time. So I got to tell a bad joke that you heard when you were six years old. What's black and white and red all over? It's the newspaper. That joke, why we don't, we don't laugh at it anymore because we've heard it a thousand times. But what's the key to that kind of joke? The key to that kind of joke is the word red is used one way in the setup and it's used in a different way when now that we've done the setup and now we're going to tell a punchline. And economists use the word liquidity in very different ways, in very different settings. And because of that, there's lots of empirical research about the effect of liquidity. And unfortunately, when people try to combine those different pieces of research, we very often have liquidity being set up one way in the beginning part of the research, and then people bringing in other studies that have used liquidity in a different way in a different meeting, or giving a conclusion that's using liquidity in a different way. And I'm bringing this up in the context of mortgage markets because it is very important to know that when a mortgage goes into foreclosure, the contract is extinguished. The original holder of that mortgage, the, the beneficial creditor, no matter how long the, you think, oh man, the, the world's going to recover in three years, it's extinguished. They don't have a liquidity problem. Okay? So if you're talking about the mortgage thing and people are going to foreclosures, we have to think, how are we using the word liquidity? Giving them extra time doesn't solve their problem if the underlying problem is default. If the underlying problem is instead uncertainty, 
maybe they have a liquidity problem. But it's important to keep that straight. And then the last preliminary I want to talk about very briefly is just the nature of analysis and what the FCIC is charged to do, and all these other commissions as well, is you have to think, are they Columbo, or are they an academic? Columbo is sent out, there's in, in every single Columbo episode that you saw, they show you the murder at the beginning. And then Columbo has to figure out what happened. And we all know what cause and effect is. There's no question about cause and effect. If someone's been stabbed seven times, then we know that someone either with an opposable thumb or maybe tentacles that can wrap did it. And we know other things didn't. We have, we have clear notions of cause and effect. But the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission would be relying, as our moderator pointed out at the beginning, on macroeconomics, and there isn't always clear consensus on what cause and effect is. So was the mission of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission to figure out what causes financial crises, and we don't know, so we gotta figure out what happens in financial crises, what causes them, or there was this financial crisis, we know what happens in a financial crisis, what caused this one? Are they Columbo in that second sense, or are they an academic researcher? And the reason that's important and part of my talk, remember I'm supposed to reflect on this commission compared to others, is, well, if there's not consensus on what causes a crisis, then a researcher should be looking for a panel database. They should be looking for multiple observations in a single time period and then multiple time periods. In other words, if someone said, what causes sports teams to win championships? And someone said the old uh, cliche, defense wins championships. And then someone pulled out a single season and said, look, the, the team with the best offense won that year, you're wrong. No, the, the, the researcher looking into what causes things, what's a panel, they want multiple seasons. And that's gonna be the argument for if what you're trying to figure out is what causes financial crises, you need a panel, you need multiple financial crises to be looking at. If instead you know what causes things, then it's perfectly okay to be Columbo and say, what caused this one? And that's an awful lot of my time devoted to that kind of stuff, but that's all right, we'll make it up. All right, so financial crisis, um, I'm gonna dig deep here. In, there's a report to the Secretary of Treasury after something called the Panic of 1837. You don't need to know anything about it other than there was a financial crisis in 1837. And uh, the Secretary of Treasury subsequently came to Congress and gave a report, here's you know what I think. And from an economist's point of view, for those of you who are economists, he explained very clearly something called the liquidationist view. Woodbury goes to Congress and he says, you know, there was a change in monetary policies and there was a boom, a credit boom, real estate, and then we had the inevitable deleveraging and deleveraging is painful. Now he doesn't put it in those terms, he puts it in the jargon of 1837, but that's clearly his message. Delever Bubbles are unavoidable, deleveraging is painful, that's what happened. That's the liquidationist view. Modern economists, generally speaking, would, macroeconomists would generally reject that view. It's the, sometimes called the liquidationist fallacy. The argument would be no Keynes, would be, uh, all the way back to Keynes, and it doesn't matter whether you're Keynes or Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman would reject this view. So whether or not you think fiscal policy can step in and avoid the bad effects of deleveraging, or whether or not you think monetary policy can step in and avoid the bad effects of deleveraging, there's lots of economists of different uh, stripes that would say that's a fallacy. And one thing I would want to point out, though, is there's an awful lot of folks who are economists, again on both sides of the aisle, who are saying too big to fail is an important thing. Well, if too big to fail is an important thing, then you are saying that how we liquidate things matters. In fact, as was pointed out earlier in this conversation, Title II of Dodd-Frank is orderly liquidation authority. It's in the title. Well, is it a fallacy or not? Well, if you're just looking at one financial crisis, that's one thing. You're sort of, sort of assuming you know, it causes things. But you might want a broader view. Okay, so that's that kind of stuff. I'll go through this because other people have talked about it. We had a mortgage uh, boom and bust, and the FCIC report, even though there's multiple pieces of multiple interpretations, all, all the interpretations except the following charge, which is, did too much credit relative to estimated risk flow into credit markets between 2001 and 2005? 
right? Was the boom due to an inefficient amount of credit flowing there? Now you can get inefficient amounts for different reasons. Peter's saying, oh, government policy might change the requirements relative to prices, so we get too much in because of government policy. On the other hand, we might say, look, there's market failures. There's going to be cases in which people have uncertainty, pass the trash, the, the ultimate, the used car market, the used car salesman knows more than I do. And so we have asymmetric information and we're going to get inefficient amounts of used car sailing, uh, sales unless we do something. Okay? Well, you can have multiple sources of that and I note that the FCIC in its what are you guys supposed to do was told they were given 22 things to look at. 20, and obviously we're not going to talk about all 22. But I can reduce about 18 of the 22 to someone has identified one potential source for mispricing relative to the efficient amount of pricing. And they all kind of boil down to that. And about the other four are some macro stuff about global savings gluts and things like that. Yeah, but a lot of it is just basic micro. Okay. Now let's get to subsequent, re like what has happened since and what have we learned from the past other things. So we'll, okay. Uh, some folks here have already talked about them. So subsequent market research, I'm going to quibble a little bit with Peter's interpretation in part because of subsequent events. So I didn't do this research myself. This is just some guy sitting in a library looking at other people producing things. And what have we got? If too much credit flowed into financial markets and inflated financial markets because people with weak credit drove it, then I should see an expansion in the percentage of the mortgage market that is made up of buyers. Buyers is important because it's purchases that goes into the appraisals. That's the house price thing. More of that should be going for people with weaker credit scores. And yet, when we look at 2002 to 2012, and if it, this is from the uh, FSOC annual report, they're saying, if you just look at the first half of that chart, between 2002 and 2008, the share of mortgages, mortgage balances going to people with the high credit is growing. They're growing as a share. So the mortgage market is growing in terms of people with good credit, which is inconsistent with either government policies is forcing people with bad credit to get loans, but it's also inconsistent with the used car sales. When we get, we, we've got a bunch of lemons out there that are getting loans because the investors can't penetrate the veil. It's inconsistent with both of those. And as you'll see as we go along, uh, I could agree with everyone or disagree with everyone, and it's usually more fun to disagree with everyone. So, and they can get their shots back there. So. All right, the other thing is, Again, if it's the, these bad credit, bad loans things that's driving everything, and then I look at trends in the foreclosure business, the people, like who's actually getting foreclosed upon, and remember, losses need a drop in house price to get the actual losses, thus the tie to the actual foreclosure. What do we see? Even before 2007, that, that white area on the left, the share of foreclosures that is prime borrowers is rising. Now again, in fairness to other people on the panel and then the people that wrote the other portions of the report, we should point out what I said earlier. Well, they might not be, the people that did this study might not be using the word prime and subprime the same way that Peter does or that the same way that the majority opinion does. Right, so I don't have a gotcha moment. This isn't a gotcha graph. Two, okay. minute, two yeah. minutes. So in two minutes, we'll just go then to the, uh, the relating this to subsequent other things. There's been other commissions. Uh, the core commission has already been mentioned, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But I went back to look at two things, the role of repos and the role of securitization. Because one of the narratives, since I did the uh, GSE narrative here, one of the narratives is financial innovation outpaced financial regulation. And, you know, I work in a library, and unlike a lot of people, I sometimes look at books. And so I went down and, and I actually looked, what, what did they deliberate when they were deliberating the, the Federal Reserve Act? In the Congressional Deliberations on the Federal Reserve Act, they had people testifying that they were doing asset-backed securities for commercial real estate in St. Louis at the time that they were deliberating the Federal Reserve Act. 
And then in that hearing, they talked about, hey, doesn't this remind me of what happened 30 years ago? And get what was, guess what would be 30 years before that would be the Panic of 1893. So I went up and I looked in the stacks, in the bond books for 1893. What bonds are available for sale in New York City in 1893? And there's institutions, one, I just brought one copy here, the Security Loan and Trust Company had issued $1.1 million in 1893 dollars in debentures. Now it's a debenture, so it's not a, an MBS, no, but it's a, those are mortgage-backed securities, they're pass-throughs. And had funded $1.2 million worth of first lien real estate with it. So they were securitizing loans from the Midwest and selling them. Now that's something that, you know, okay, so that's not new. The point actually is that, that the, when they deliberated the Federal Reserve, they talked about it, and then the original Federal Reserve Act allows the trusts to become members of the Federal Reserve System. So this notion that when they set up the Federal Reserve, they had no concept of this, and that's outside their scope, they don't know what they're talking about, you know, this is all new, hmm, might come back to that. The second thing I looked up for repurchase agreements, because the other piece is, man, repurchase agreements. That's inherently a bet, you know, like this risky thing that hasn't come up. And I thought to myself, repurchase agreements, inherently risky, that's collateralized interbank lending. You know what's risky? Not collateralized interbank lending. <laughs> so if you remember the LIBOR scandal, the LIBOR scandal was essentially that the people reporting their uncollateralized interbank lending, they were reporting false results on that. So that fed into that. So I looked up the OCC report to Congress during the Great Depression, and they have these multiple years, and sure enough, for the state banking system, it has very little that's called agreements to repurchase securities sold, very little in 1930, uh, 29 and 30, and then it spikes to 1931 and down to 32. And to give you a sense of very little, um, this is in, uh, it goes from $5 million in 1929 to $303 million in 1931, down to $9 million in 1932. So they turned, the state banking system turned to repurchase agreements when they got cut off. And why might they do that? Because the rules at that time was securities could not be used as collateral for lending at the Fed. So there's actually something called the Glass-Steagall Act, which expanded the, everyone thinks Glass-Steagall Act is the second act. And there was a Glass-Steagall Act before that one that expanded eligible collateral at the Fed. So you might see a drop off, and I'm done. done. Yep. <laughs>